Hello Year 11 and welcome to revision session 2 of Animal Farm. You're going to need to have your documents ready from last lesson. So that'll be a piece of paper and pen where you were making notes last time, use of your exercise book or otherwise the Google Docs where you started to make notes and add your own personal ideas. Session 2 is looking entirely at ideas of character and theme. The two simple aims for this week we're looking to comment on what characters can add to the novel, so we're not just describing them, but we're looking at how they behave towards others, the reasons why they behave, that's their motivation, and what their thoughts and feelings are. And then we're going to comment on how they might be linked to the themes, and the themes are the grand ideas that make us human, that George Orwell wants to discuss in the novel. So you've got examples of greed, and power, control, work, companionship, how do those themes connect to the characters? So that's the job of this week. Any character in a novel is a construct. It's an invention. It's been made up by the author. And the reason why a character is invented or is constructed is so that we, the readers, can understand a quite a difficult topic from different points of view. So if we just give an example to that, you have a really difficult topic of the Russian Revolution which started off with hope and equality and has now become a totalitarian dictatorship. George Orwell is understandably worried about this happening in our country and he wants to raise awareness and therefore has a very critical voice against the discrimination that happens against the working man. So there's a lot in there that we need to unpack. First of all then he says, well, how am I going to communicate this in a way that people understand? So what he decided to do was take one character that represented that working man and tell things from his point of view. So therefore the character of Boxer was created to illustrate what happens to that sort of person when they're placed in a totalitarian government. They have no control, they're constantly having to work, their needs are not met, they're underfed, they're not rested, what happens? And ultimately he's become so ill that he has to be sent off to the knacker's yard and eventually we learn that he dies. Then he says, well, what happens to people who choose not to accept that at all and don't want to be part of the system? Well, there you have your character of Moses. Now, Moses is meant to represent the religious element. They kind of fly above everybody else. They have their strong beliefs in God, in heaven will be a better place if you work hard in this world. His belief, of course, in the story is Sugar Candy Mountain will be a place you'll go to if you work hard. And so we can see from the character of Moses that some characters don't have to work hard at all. They can just flit above everybody else. They have these strong morals. They come in every now and then to booster up the population and then they leave again. Or you might have a character who really understands sacrifice. You've got Jessie. She just whelps lots of pups. She doesn't raise them as a mother and give them the care and concern we'd expect any creature to do. She isn't even able to wean or milk them. And they're just taken away from her. Just like in Nazi Germany, for example, the young people were taken away from their family's influence to be part of an organisation, as you know, Hitler's Youth, and they were brainwashed. And as you can see in the novel, those sweet little innocent pups come back as ferocious SS equivalents. So you can see that each character has a role. They've got an opinion, something to say on the difficult subject matter that the writer wants to show. So when we're looking at characters, I don't want to think of it in a simplistic way. What are they? What do they look like? What do they like to do? We're saying, well, what is their opinion on this topic? What do they add to the story? What would happen if we didn't have that character in the story? Where would we lose the benefit? So that's the type of analytical approach we're going to take to characters. So here we come to another test bite. So if that is your signal to stop the presentation where we are at the moment. Go on to Google Classroom and if you go to task two you will see that there is a quiz waiting for you called Understanding Character and Theme. Answer each of those questions and it will give you a mark out of 10. If you notice though the last question is worth four marks so that means that you need to write four separate things in order to pick up the full 100% 10 out of 10. Okay so have fun doing that. I hope you've listened carefully Please don't be afraid to go back to the video to the previous slide and listen again if you're not quite sure because the aim is for you to complete as many questions and get as many marks as you possibly can. Okay, good luck then. When you're ready, 
go on to the next slide. Right, this is going to be quite a long one on this slide, so you're going to need your pen and paper. What I suggest you do is to write down the character's name as your subheading and note any bullet points or keywords that you think are interesting. So I'm going to start with Old Major. And what I'm going to do is explain to you what their role is and the reason why the author decided to put them in the book. OK, so Old Major is only present in Chapter One, but he has a far reaching impact on the experiment of animalism. He's the character who provides hope of a better life through his inspirational dream. He presents the idea of animalism to the other animals and he sets out man as the enemy, therefore uniting the animals for the first time. Let's move on to Napoleon now. Now he's a boar. Now that's no um, accident. A boar is literally a pig, but it can also mean somebody who's boring, troublesome, a pain in the neck. And I think that's the view that our author, George Orwell, was trying to communicate. He's presented as hard, he's quiet, he's sullen and sulky. Orwell asks, what happens when a dream comes corrupted? What happens when you're obsessed with control and you use violent means such as the ferocious dogs which Napoleon trains up? And this character explores what happens when leaders of equal societies become interested only in themselves. The outcome for Napoleon is totalitarianism and a return to the same harsh regime as before. Now, some readers argue that Napoleon is much worse than Jones. That's up to you to see where you think your judgment is. How involved do you think he is in the experiment of animalism? Thirdly then is Snowball, who's a lively, passionate and intelligent good leader. He's one of us, one of the animals, and he wins loyalty of others and he cements his power by doing that. He's completely devoted to old major's thinking and is probably the character who's nearest to that thought. He brings education and planning to the experiment. He's a thinker and a strategist. And George Orwell asks what happens when an intelligent thinker challenges a man or a rival for power. And in this case, in the book, he's expelled, which actually is quite common in Russia to either kill, expel or imprison your rivals. If you look at the incident that's happening with Putin and Navalny at the moment, Alexei Navalny has come back to Russia after being poisoned and finds himself in prison for two or three years. The next character then is the last of the pigs, Squealer. He's a lively pig. He's described as vivacious. Vivacious means full of life and joy. And he plays the role of a propagandist. And what that job is, is to spread Napoleon's message as if it were truth. Now, if you think Twitter and what that did for Trump by directly communicating to his base, that is what Squealer does for Napoleon. So George Orwell asks, what happens when dictators want to control the economy and the hearts and minds of its population? Well, they need the media to do this for them. And Pravda, P-R-A-V-D-A, was the newspaper owned by the state in Russia at the time. Orwell uses Squealer to explore the ways in which leaders use rhetoric and language to twist the truth in order that those leaders can maintain control. So he's a powerful symbol of control and we can see this most of all at the end of the story when Squealer is the first animal to walk on hind legs and you've guessed it, he literally walks in the same way as man. So he goes right back to the beginning of the experiment. So the next character is Boxer. He's the horse and he represents the working man. He's strong, selfless, but uneducated. And he's used to build the success of animalism and then abandoned when he's no longer any use. Orwell uses him to show what happens to those who show unquestioning loyalty to the regime. And the answer, sadly, is death. He's sent off to the knacker's yard. He's killed, isn't he? Orwell empathises most with Boxer as the abused worker. And we explored that last week when we saw his commitment to the working man when he was in the Spanish Civil War. The next character is Benjamin. Now he's the donkey. Donkeys are notoriously stubborn old mules and Benjamin is no exception. In fact, his main quote for him is, donkeys live for a long time. He represents the common man who's seen it all before. And although he's in a communist animalist society, he doesn't really believe in the dream. For him, life won't get better and it won't get worse, it will just be as bad as it is now, no matter who rules. But his shining moment in the story is the care he shows the dying boxer. 
which shows us as readers that he cares for people and not systems. The next character is the motherly creature of Clover. She's a good-hearted female cart horse and she's absolutely devoted to Boxer. She's the honest victim in this experiment of animalism. She has enough intelligence to know that the rules are wrongly being manipulated, but her faith in the system is so strong that she blames herself for the misunderstanding of the rules. Molly, another female character, is the beautiful mare who's so vain that she prefers ribbons, which are called the badge of slavery by Snowball. She prefers these ribbons over her own freedom as part of the animalism experiment. She doesn't want to be equal to everybody else. She just wants to be well fed and have lots of luxuries. And so she opts out of the experiment as soon as she possibly can. When she realises that animal animalism means self-responsibility and hard work, she gets out of there as soon as she can. She prefers to be well fed and work as a slave than to be equal to others. Now Moses is a male character and he's the tame raven. He's absolutely despised by the other animals because he's seen as man's pet. Now his main role is to explore how communism, in this case animalism, exploits religion. Because remember, he's the one who introduces everybody to Sugar Candy Mountain, which is like heaven, the place you go to if you work hard on this earth. Now Karl Marx, who was a great philosopher and really invested in the idea of communism, said that religion is the opium of the masses. You know opium is a poppy, it's a poppy drug, isn't it? He said that people like Moses almost drug people and convince them into believing that they can't change their future. They might as well work really hard because they'll be rewarded in the next life. So as you can probably guess, George Orwell also despised that kind of character. And that's it for the animals. We're now on to the humans. So our first human is the man we meet in chapter one, Mr. Jones. He's the farmer of Manor Farm and he maltreats the animals. What happens when the population's had enough of being oppressed? Well, you're overthrown and he never regains power again throughout the entire novel. In fact, halfway through, he dies completely alone and unknown. He's very bitter. Then we have Frederick. Frederick is the one who is of Pinchfield Farm. He's the neighbour of the animalism regime. He's not personally involved, but he exploits the system. He conducts sly, secret trade deals to maximise his own personal profit. His system is a completely different one to animalism. It's based on capitalism, and that is where it's based on maximising your personal wealth. And we see him as a character who's completely untrustworthy. And the last character, Pinkleton, is a Foxwood farm. He's another neighbour and he's a gentleman on the outside. His exterior looks as if he's very polite and respectful but he's equally as corrupt as Frederick and he's a role model for Napoleon. So now that you've had a rundown of each of those characters you're going to evaluate how close they are to the experiment of animalism and if you click onto the next slide I'll show you how to do it. Right, so at this stage then we're going to set you up on your third task of the week which you will find on Google Classroom called Evaluating the Roles of Characters. As we've said, characters are not just there for a little bit of fun, to be interesting, to involve the reader. They have a particular role. They are a construct of the author. And what that means is they've got a certain opinion or a view on the main topic. And for us the main topic is animalism which represents equality. So in animalism, remember the slogan, all animals are equal. So if we looked at this image on the right hand side and we looked right at the center of belief in animalism, that all animals are equal, which character do you think is the one that most believe that and has most impact on other people? And then you see on the blue line, on that edge there, who do you think might be heavily involved in promoting the values of equality and showing that all animals must follow animalism. Who would you put there? One character, two characters? And then look on the black line. Who do you think is still involved but has a choice? They don't necessarily believe everything about animalism. They're not entirely convinced. They're a bit suspicious. They manipulate the systems, so they do what they want. They leave, they return, some don't leave. Who would you place on that black circle 
And finally, in green, who was never involved in the process in the first place? Who's trying to corrupt that system to meet their own ends? Who would like to see the whole system of equality disintegrate and they take control of that system? Okay, so let's just work out who we might put where. Let's look at how that could possibly work out. So if we take, say, the character of Benjamin, now we know that Benjamin is part of the system because he lives on the farm and he has to work as much as everybody else. We know that whenever we see Benjamin, he tends to be with Boxer. And we know that Boxer represents a theme of work in this story. So we would put Benjamin as a worker involved in the action. But does Benjamin really go around persuading everybody else that this is a good idea? He's that stubborn old mule. He's the donkey, if you remember. And he believes that people will always follow whatever is in control, but it will never be a positive experience. It will always be bad news. There will always be malnutrition, um, maltreated rather. They will always suffer from malnutrition. So as a result of that, we probably wouldn't put Benjamin in the centre and neither would we have him entirely on the outside, would we? Because that would mean that he's not involved in the process at all. But we could think about putting him on the blue or the black line. So let's refine our decision. The blue line are those who are involved in it and continue to promote the idea of equality. Well, Benjamin's not really a promoter of anything, is he? So probably the best place for him would be on the black line. And the reason we'd say is because Benjamin is involved in animalism because he's a worker on the farm, but he doesn't have any belief that it will bring him goodness in his life. And that would be the reason we'd write down. So you're going to do the same thing now. You're going to edit your document, add the names of the characters where you think they're best placed, and for each character, write down a reason. Once you've done that, upload it. I'll check it on Google Classroom for you, and then you're ready to move on to the next slide. Hello again. So we know now that the characters have a role. They have a particular viewpoint that they're contributing to the overall theme of animalism in the book, communism in Russia at the time. And they have a set of views that they're adding to the debate. So you and I, the reader, can make up our mind whether we can trust this idea of communism or whether, as Orwell is trying to warn us, that it ultimately becomes that some people are greedy and they just want to have more than everybody else, equality doesn't exist. It's actually summed up in that phrase, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. So that could be a quote that's well worth recording. In this slide here, we're looking at not characters as in their roles in the story, but as allegorical figures. And we've looked at what an allegory is already, haven't we? It's a fairy tale where underneath there's a deeper real life meaning that helps us to question how we view the world around us. In this list of characters, which are not exhaustive, you'll see that there are quite a few characters missing from here. Each of the characters either represent an organisation, an individual or a general belief towards the Russian Revolution in 1917. So if we just go for a couple, of the individuals you have Snowball, now he represents Leon Trotsky, who was a good friend of Joseph Stalin. And Trotsky was very intelligent. He set up lots of committees. He was seen as a serious challenger to Stalin and Stalin didn't want to share power anymore. So ultimately, he bumped him off. He sent him abroad, sent him in exile, and he sent his KGB, who's the equivalent of the SS, his secret police, to make sure that Trotsky didn't return. And we hear that he did survive, but he never went back to Russia to challenge the leadership. And then you've got people who represent organisations. So if we go to, for example, the dogs, they were indeed stolen. The people were taken. They were educated in re-education camps and they became the secret police known as the KGB. And Putin, who is the current leader of Russia, was an ex-KGB member. So they have all sorts of secret networks and manipulations, very violent history, sending a lot of people up to the Arctic Circle to the gulags. And the gulags are the concentration camps of the north. Then you have some general beliefs. So here, for example, you have um, Benjamin, and he represents just the general belief of the quiet working man who's quite sceptical. He's not sure whether it's a system that can benefit others. And Clover, who doesn't appear in this list, 
is a working class woman. She doesn't feel she has any power and control over her own life and therefore she sort of beats herself up about it. She challenges herself and thinks she misunderstands the belief systems which are shown. Molly, too, is not just a vain, selfish Russian, but she represents the petty bourgeoisie. Now, the petty bourgeoisie were the people who were sort of small family owners of businesses, might be bakers, might be butchers, they might own their own solicitor firm, and as soon as they realised that the going was going to get tough and everybody being equal meant that everybody was, had to work hard for equal pay and they would have an enormous pay cut, they decided to evacuate themselves. They escaped pretty early on in the experiment and they worked in the local communities of other surrounding countries who weren't part of the Soviet Union. So each character has a role in the story, but they also represent a real life person, organisation or belief which occurred at the time in 1917. The only people who were not really on there because they weren't involved in Russia were Frederick and Pinkleton. And Frederick represents the satellite countries. That means those countries who bordered the Soviet Union, such as West Germany and Western Europe. And Pinkleton represents Britain and the US, who were appearing to be very respectful and gentlemanly on the outside by condemning communism, but secretly there was trade going on and they were quite envious of Stalin's three-year and five-year plans and how successful initially communism appeared. So now you have an overview of that, what I'd like to do is to add this information to your notes for each character. You can either do it as a mind map or you can continue to bullet point your information that you have collected from slide six. Right, let's move on to themes now then, shall we? Each of the characters is linked to several themes and each of the themes is linked to several characters. And this done well will actually provide you with a clear paragraph plan that you could write about any essay that you are given. So let's be clear about what a theme is. A theme is one of the big ideas of the novel. A theme is something that affects you and me in our everyday lives. It's part of what makes us human. We've all experienced some kind of violence, whether it's been play with friends or physical violence, being hit by somebody unexpectedly. We've seen violence in films, in television, maybe on the internet. We've all had some sort of power control. We've either controlled other people or we've been in control. So you might have been perhaps, I don't know, in a coaching role to a friend, or you may have been listening to somebody who's been giving you instructions, such as me instructing you now. Therefore, I have the strength of power in this relationship we're talking about. You might have given power over to somebody, your horse riding, and the instructor has more power and control over the way that you're controlling the horse. So we all have these different dreams, hopes, plans, cleverness, um, rules that we have to follow in life. It is what makes us who we are as humans. And the whole idea of having a theme in a novel is that it allows us to be able to question these themes, these big ideas. Well. Do we want to be the one in control or do we want to be controlled? Is it true that every time somebody's powerful, they're corrupted? What are dreams? Are dreams for us as individuals, as communities? It helps us to be questioning. And when, when we see one of the characters in the story representing one of these themes, it's there to help us to think about whether we agree with that viewpoint or not. Now, the overall view of this author is that every time somebody comes to power, it always ends up in corruption. There's no such thing as equality. It's a nice idea, but if everybody's equal, there'll always be somebody who's more competitive and wants more. Greed is part of human nature, and therefore there's no such thing as a successful communist society. Now you might not agree with that, but that is the view that George Orwell is placing to us, handing it to us on a plate as he tells us this story. So let's look now to see how these characters are linked to themes. Right, let's move on to themes now then, shall we? So each of the characters is linked to a theme, and each of the theme is linked to several characters. Right, here's your chance to empty everything in your head now. So before we go on any further, we're just going to look at which characters you know and which themes you know from this page. And you're just going to link the two together, see if you can explain why. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes to do that. When you're ready, you can go on to the next slide. If you're a bit stuck and you just need a model, 
hold on for a bit and I'll explain one example to you. Right, hello. So you're needing a bit of guidance at this stage. So if we take that theme of power, who would we say is most in control? It would probably be Napoleon, wouldn't it? He's got violent power because he threatens people and he doesn't mind killing the other animals. And he's the only person who wants to be in control. So we can see that he's quite a corrupt, powerful leader, isn't he? But you also have the type of soft power through the character of Snowball. He's so persuasive, he's really educated, he encourages a lot of loyalty from the other animals. That's another way of looking at power, isn't it? And then you've got a character like Benjamin who just doesn't want any power at all. He's not interested in investing himself in the idea of equality or animalism. He doesn't work any harder than he should or any slower than he should. His power comes from within himself, so he controls his own destiny. See if you can do that same idea, looking at another theme and linking different characters to it. I would go to something like lies and deceit as your next point. So let's take a look at what we've done this week so far. We've realised that characters are constructs and that they represent a particular view on the topic of animalism, power and equality. We've noticed in this novel that the characters are allegorical because this novel is an allegory. And remember that an allegory is a story that is simplistic on the outskirts, but when you dig deeper and you look underneath, it represents a real life event with lots of different morals for us to consider. And so our characters are allegorical. They also have a particular viewpoint on a theme that help us as readers to reflect on our lives and to think about what it is to be human and look at what we value in life. We're building up now to your mini assessment for the end of this week. So go on to the next slide and I'll explain to you what you need to do. So for this task, you'll need to go onto Google Classroom again, have a look on classwork and you will see that task four is called analysing characters. And I've shared a sheet with you this time and you'll notice at the top are all of the characters' names and then down on the left hand side are all the things we can learn about the characters and they correspond with this page. So I'm just gonna talk you through what they mean. So when we're looking at the characters, we need to see what their role is in the story and we need to know what their views are and that will help us to understand their perspective on animalism. Characterization means what sort of character, not a nice or a nasty, but are they a leader or are they an inspirational? Or are they a shirker? Somebody who shirks means that they don't like to work. They just release responsibility. Are they stubborn? Would you call them religious? So what kind of role job do they play within the story? The actions speak for themselves. So what do they do to show that they're that kind of leader, that kind of dictator, etc.? The beliefs are, what do they believe? And you'll find that these characters always talk about certain things. If we talk about the character of Moses, his belief or his interest is Sugar Candy Mountain. He always believes that if you work hard in this world, you'll then be successful in the next world. The allegory is which individual, organisation or belief do they symbolise in communist Russia? And finally, the theme is what they have looked at this time. Now notice the question is which theme do they most represent? You don't have to write lots of themes, but if you find that particularly easy and want to stretch yourself, then you can link them to several themes if you want to. So on the spreadsheet, you've got lots of examples. Some of it has been filled in for you to give you a model for each of the main areas that you can see on this slide here. So what you're going to do is you're going to add your ideas in a different colour font to the one that I've presented on the screen. Once you've done it and you've really thought carefully about what each of these characters is providing us with, then you're going to upload it in the usual way. That will leave you with one task, the task that you started last week. And that is, can you just make sure please that you finish reading the book and that you have filled in the plot tracker so you know the story. Other than that, you've done really well this week. We've covered a lot. Keep working because your revision is making a big difference to your understanding of the text. Thank you then everyone.